This is going to be Genesis chapter 27, and I'm going to talk about overcoming deception. And in this chapter, you got Isaac. He's old. He's well stricken in years. He's lost his eyesight. And Jacob is going to come in and deceive him. And Rebekah is behind the deception. And Esau even tries to deceive Isaac a little bit as well. Every member of his family lies to him in this chapter. Now, <clears throat> you don't want to be like Isaac. You want to overcome deception. One of the first things I want to talk about is don't lose your zeal for the truth in old age. In Genesis 27, 1, And it came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son... And he said unto him, Behold, here am I. So, first thing we see, he's old. He's well stricken in years, but let's try to figure out Isaac's age. And you can do this. You can go to Genesis 47, 9. And in Genesis 47, 9, like 20 chapters later, you see that Jacob, which is Isaac's son, you find that Jacob is 130 years old. So, and if you look at Jacob's son, Joseph, at that time, he is 39 years old. So, you're going to take the 130, which is Jacob's age, subtract, subtract 39, Joseph's age, you get 91. So, this means Jacob had to be 91 when Joseph was born. And then, Joseph is born after Jacob has been working for Laban for 14 years. So 91 minus 14, and that's 77. This means that Jacob would have had to leave home to work for Laban when he was 77 years old. And that's at the end of this chapter. You see that Jacob leaves and goes to work for Laban when he's 77 14 years later, he has Joseph, making him 91. Then, in Genesis 47, 9, Jacob is 130. So that's how you can track it. So if Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born, then you add 77. Because in this chapter, Jacob 77. So if Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born... Add 77 and 60. This would make Isaac 137 when he blesses Jacob in this chapter. <coughs> Isaac doesn't die until he's 180 in Genesis 35, 28. So this means that Isaac actually lives another 43 years after this chapter even takes place. And he thinks he's on his deathbed in this chapter, yet he's going to live 43 more years. A good reason uh, he probably thought he was on his deathbed is because Ishmael, his brother, Isaac's brother Ishmael, died when he was 137. So maybe Isaac thinks he's going to die at the same age of his brother. But, with that being said, you may begin to lose your sight with old age, but this doesn't mean you must become spiritually blind as well. For example, in 1 Kings 14, 4, the prophet Ahijah's eyes were set by reason of his age. It said he could not see. At the same time, he was seeing 2020, spiritually speaking. Isaac seems to have lost his sight physically and spiritually. And he falls right into the lies of his family. And you can't help but feel bad for the old guy. I mean, he's in there on his deathbed thinking he's about to kick the bucket and everyone in his family is about to deceive him. So he calls in Esau, his eldest son, and this is his favorite as we found out in previous chapters. Esau is the rough hunter type character. Uh, his other son, Jacob, is the plain man, mommy's boy type. It says in Genesis 27.1, and it came to pass that when Isaac was old, and his eyes were dim, so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, 
I am old, I know not the day of my death. So Isaac is old, and he says, I know not the day of my death. And those are wise words. That's a good thing to underline. I know not the day of my death. And you don't want to wait until you're old as Isaac is to start thinking about death. I mean, because it could happen tomorrow. In Job 7, 6, and 7, it says, My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is wind. Mine eyes shall see no more good. Your life is swift. It's like wind. It says in Psalm 90 and verse 9, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. You don't know the day of your death. You don't know when you're going to die. Make sure that you do today what you'll wish you did if you lived to be 80, 100, 137, which you're probably not going to. And maybe you did good all your life. Maybe you've done good all your life. Don't stop having a zeal for the truth in your old age. Finish your course. A lot of times when you get older, you start just kind of just falling off and you don't really study or read the Bible as much as you did maybe. You should finish your course study as much as you did when you're 80 as you did when you were 20-something. But you don't know when you're going to die. You don't know the day of your death. So finish your course. Make sure you're ready for eternity. Make sure the people around you know that you love them and leave them with something to help them. So that's the first thing. Don't lose your zeal for the truth in old age like Isaac has the next thing focus more on the spiritual than on the physical now Isaac he can picture a saint who has lost his spiritual eyesight and he's now relying on his fleshy senses to direct himself through life and he says to Esau in verse 3 now therefore take I pray thee thy weapons thy quiver and thy bow and go out to the field and take me some venison. So he wants Esau, a mighty hunter, to take his quiver, which is his case for his arrows and stuff, and his bow. And he wants him to get in his pickup truck and go out to the field and kill some deer. He says, take me some venison. Meaning, bring me back some deer meat. Now, what you don't want to do is... You never want to cross what the Word of God says. If you cross what the Bible says, you're going to be deceived automatically. It is the place where you are guaranteed truth is in the Scriptures. So when you cross what it says, you're deceived automatically. And he says in verse 4, Make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, and that my soul may bless thee before I die. So to bless Esau instead of Jacob, Isaac is going to have to cross the word of God. He's going to have to ignore the words of God that he gave to Rebekah in Genesis 25, 23, where he told her that the elder would serve the younger. He has to overlook the fact that Esau said his, sold his birthright in Genesis twenty five thirty three, he has to overlook Esau's grievous marriages in Genesis twenty six thirty five. When you do wrong, you go against a lot of things that you have knowledge of, and he's going against a lot of things to do what he's going to do with Esau. But notice that Isaac's main focus is on physical things. He's he's thinking about his belly. Philippians 3.19 talks about how a person's God can be their belly. Do you think about food more than you think about God? Do you think about the money it takes to buy the food more than you think about God? Uh, Isaac thinks he's about to die, and he wants Esau to go out and get him some deer meat to eat before he dies. The crazy thing is, you don't actually see Isaac die until many years later in Genesis 25 and Genesis 35.28. But anyway, when Esau gets back with the savory meat, Isaac is going to bless him. Esau and Isaac didn't know that Rebekah was eavesdropping on the entire conversation. Everything that was just said about him going out and getting deer meat and all that stuff, she heard every bit of it. 
And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau his son, in verse 5, And Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. And Rebekah spake unto Jacob her son, saying, Behold, I heard thy father speak unto Esau thy brother, saying, Bring me venison, and make me savory meat, that I may eat and bless thee before the Lord, before my death. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. So, Rebecca, eavesdropping, first thing she did was ran and told Jacob. And remember that Rebecca's favorite is Jacob. Isaac's favorite is Esau. Also remember what the Lord told Rebecca back in Genesis twenty-five twenty-three. In Genesis twenty-five twenty-three, it says, And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. The, so the Lord told Rebekah. The elder shall serve the younger. That means Esau would serve Jacob. So she's worried that Esau is going to be blessed by Isaac and ruin the prophecy. She doesn't realize that no matter what happens, the word of God is going to come to pass. The Lord doesn't need her to come up with a deceptive plan to make his prophecy come to pass, even though at the same time he could easily use her disobedience and her deception to make it come to pass, because no matter what you do, you're not going to change it. Once God said it back in Genesis twenty-five, twenty-three, that settled it. Nothing could change it. No matter what Rebekah did, the elder would still serve the younger. Esau would have came out serving Jacob no matter what. It just goes to show you that no matter what you do, when God says something, that settles it. But now look what she says to Jacob in verse 8. Genesis 27 and verse 8. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice according to that which I command thee. Now, if the last two verses of <coughs> chapter 26 is chronological with this chapter, then we know that Esau and Jacob are 40 years old at the least because they're twins. And it says that Esau uh, married these women in the last chapter when he was 40 years old. But going by what I talked about earlier, we found that they're actually even older than that, if that's calculating it up correctly. We found out that they're actually 77 years old. So by this conversation, though, you get the idea that this is a mommy talking to her small baby boy. But notice she says to obey my voice. And I believe it's the right thing to honor father and mother. But at the same time, you don't just follow what man says over what God says. Because in Acts 5.29, it says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Jacob would have done well not to listen to Rebecca, even though it's his mother. He would have done well not to obey her voice and what she commanded him to do because it was being deceptive. It was wrong. It, he was going to be lying to his father. And then it actually got them both in a big mess. Now, verse 9 in Genesis 27. Now, it says, Go now to the flock. Genesis 27, 9. She says, Go now to the flock and fetch me from thence two kids of the goats, and I will make them savory meat for thy father, such as he loveth. So instead of deer meat or venison, they're going to use goat meat. I guess Rebecca knows how to spice it up real good to make it taste the same or something. And it says, And thou shalt bring it to thy father, that he may eat, and that he may bless thee before his death. And Jacob said to Rebecca his mother, Behold, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. My father will peradventure fill me, and I shall seem to him as a deceiver, and I shall bring a curse upon me, and not a blessing. Now, something you should never do is tell your kid to lie to your spouse. That's the worst thing you can do. You know, you don't want to make your kid lie to his dad. You don't want to make your kid lie to his mom. I mean, if they're going to lie to their mom, they're going to lie to you. Notice he says, I shall seem to him as a deceiver. 
And that would be Isaac seeing Jacob for what he really is. Jacob is a deceiver. He is a trickster. He is a supplanter. He tried to grab a hold of Esau's heel on the way out of the womb just so that he could be first. Jacob means supplanter. He's someone that wants to be first at all costs. He isn't at all worried about doing this deceitful thing just because it's deceitful. He's worried about doing it because he's afraid he's going to get caught doing it. Not to be too hard on Jacob. I mean, he's one of the great men of the Bible. I'm no better than he is. But he's not one of my favorite characters to read. He's one of my least favorite characters in the Bible. And he tells Rebecca that when Isaac feels his smooth arms, how smooth his arms are, and how they aren't hairy like Esau's arms, Isaac will notice the deception and curse him. That's what he's afraid of. And his mother said unto him, Upon me be thy curse, my son. Only obey my voice and go fetch me them. So the curse does actually come on her and Jacob. You'll find out later that Rebekah will never see Jacob again. Also, you'll find that later in life that Jacob is deprived of his favorite son and left to worry about him for years. Do you know why? Because a deceitful act from his own sons. His own sons come up with a plan to sell his favorite son to sell him off for pieces of silver. You see, a man will reap what he sows even if it happens later in life. Jacob gets hit with it later in life in several different places. And it says, And he went and fetched <coughs> and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory meat such as his father loved. And Rebekah took goodly raiment of her eldest son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them upon Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats upon his hands and upon the smooth of his neck. So Rebekah's trying to make the Lord's prophecy come to pass when he doesn't need her to make it come to pass. She's worried sick that uh, the elder's not going to serve the younger. She's worried sick that the younger's going to serve the elder. So she's putting things in her own hands. It's like today, you don't have to worry about when the rapture is going to take place it's going to take place you don't have to sit around and and uh add all this stuff up about when it's going to happen and all this stuff and like this one guy on every every study i put out there he leaves a comment where it says the prophecy is going to happen this day and then it doesn't come and then the next week he's got another little plan about how the rapture is going to happen this day and it's like, in a way, he thinks that it's up to him to make it happen. Look, the rapture's going to happen anyway. We just need to keep serving God until it happens and just leave it at that. Just keep doing what you need to be doing until it happens. Uh, she, Rebecca should have just kept doing what she needed to do and stay out of God's stuff. But this is what you have here. She's dressing Jacob up like something that he's not. She is literally uh, putting goat tear on him to make him look hairy. She's literally going to pull the wool over Isaac's eyes. That's where you get that saying. She's going to pull the wool over his eyes. This is a smooth man dressing up like a rough man. If a false prophet wants to deceive a Bible believer, he can't dress up like a smooth man. You know, a, a false prophet's usually very smooth. And that's how you deceive people is by being smooth. But the Bible believer spots that stuff from a mile away. So for a false prophet to deceive a Bible believer, he has to be rough and disguise his smoothness. And I've seen a lot of guys like that. I've seen it the one way where they're smooth and they deceive people that aren't Bible believers, that don't read the Bible. Then I've seen a false, false prophets that they are smooth, but they disguise themselves as rough. And then they deceive the Bible believers. They are real rough when they preach, and they use a lot of rough talk, and then they mix in a lot of right doctrine to mask their false doctrine. They are smooth, but they disguised it as being rough to trick the Bible believer. And that's what Jacob's going to do. 
Verse 17, And she gave the savory meat and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. And he came unto his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I. Who art thou, my son? See, already he's like, right away Isaac suspects that this is not Esau. He, he says, Who art thou, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, thy firstborn. I have done according as thou badest me. Arise, I pray thee, sit and eat of my venison, that thy soul may bless me. Now notice that Jacob has learned from his father to tell lies. Isaac had a lying problem, just like Abraham. Notice he tells at least three lies in this verse. The first one says, he said, I am Esau. No, nope, you're Jacob. Number two, he says, I have done according as thou badest me. Isaac told him to do nothing. He told Esau to do something. He'd tell him to do anything. Number three, he says, eat of my venison. But it's not venison. He got the meat from the goats. He didn't go out and kill a deer and prepare it and stuff. And then it says, And Isaac said unto his son, How is it that thou hast found it so quickly, my son? And he said, Because the Lord thy God brought it to me. Always watch out for people who say, The Lord is bleeding me to do this or that. Many times people will use the Lord in their deception. I just feel the Lord in this, telling me to tell you this, telling me to tell you to do this. You see, they want to bring the Lord in it. That way they seem more spiritual. They can trick you. You see, Jacob knows that, I mean, Isaac is Abraham's son. Abraham's a friend of God. So Isaac's got, you know, that spiritually spirituality to him and stuff. And he knows that he can, you know, he can pull the wool over Isaac's eyes talking this way. But once again, Isaac suspects something. He's wondering how Esau could have went out there and killed the deer and prepared it for him to eat it so quickly. He said, how is it that thou hast found it so quickly? Notice the answer from Jacob. He says, because the Lord thy God brought it to me. So he lies again. And he also brings God into the deception. Religious deceivers always use God in their deception. It makes it sound so spiritual. Notice he said, the Lord thy God. Maybe that is what he thinks Esau would have said. Seeing as how Esau isn't in fellowship with God and has married the idolatrous wives of the land and so he would say he wouldn't say the Lord my God, he would say the Lord thy God. Could be looking into it too much there, but that's a possibility. And Isaac said unto Jacob, Come near, I pray thee, that I may feel thee. Like I said, Isaac wants to go by his physical senses. He's not relying on his spiritual senses. He says, That I may feel thee, my son whether thou be my very son Esau or not. Notice what Isaac is going to do. He's going to go by feeling. This is where you get to saying, you cannot trust your feelings. I remember Danny Castle <clears throat> had a sermon that I heard in person called, You Can't Trust Your Feelings. A great sermon that uses this same story. But you can't trust your feelings. They deceive you. Isaac should have recognized that the voice was different. He should have went by the voice. He did recognize that it was different. Look what it says in verse 22. And Jacob went near unto Isaac, his father, and he felled him and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. If you're a Bible believer that is consistently in the book, then you're going to know the voice of a deceiver versus the voice of the truth. Matthew 7, 20 talks about how you'll know a false prophet by his fruits. And if you look at Hebrews 13, 15, it talks about the fruit of your lips. His fruits can be what's coming out of his mouth. Isaac should have known he was stepping into being deceived when he heard the voice. I mean, you can put in a false prophet on a cassette tape. Don't even have to see him, where he's at, what he looks like, what he's wearing. And you can know by what's coming out of his mouth if he's a deceiver. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you have heard enough of the word, then you can spot a counterfeit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We walk by faith in what we've 
heard and read from the scriptures. And Isaac is wanting to walk by his senses instead of he heard a voice and he knew it wasn't the right voice. He didn't want to go by that. Me and you need to walk by faith and not by sight, as Paul says. I need to walk by what I've read in the Bible, not by what I see, smell, taste, touch in this world. Jacob had his own voice, and he disguised himself as Esau. He still had the same voice. This picture is a Christian dressing up like the world. Because remember, Jacob's a picture of the spirit. Isaac, uh, Esau's a picture of the flesh. So this picture is a Christian dressing up like the world. Jacob's dressing up like Esau. Or a Christ, it pictures a Christian walking in the flesh. You're still a Christian. But you're walking in the flesh. You look like the world. Remember that Jacob and Esau picture the flesh versus the spirit. Jacob pictures a saint walking in the flesh. And Isaac should have known as soon as he heard his voice that he was about to be deceived or in danger of being deceived. In John 10, 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I'm, I'm not a Bible genius, but the majority of the time when I hear a false prophet on TV or on the radio or on YouTube, there's something off about what's coming out of their mouth. And it's like sirens going off in my mind, and I'm like, I don't know about that. Or just even like a Bible-believing preacher, when he gets up and says something that's against the Scriptures or maybe his own opinion and he's trying to make it be the scriptures. Something in my mind, like I hear sirens going off, like that's not right. And then you just don't acknowledge that. You put it away. And if it's just something really bad, then you put that person away. You don't listen to him. But Isaac wants to go by his physical senses. It would be sight if he had it. But instead of that, he's going to go by touch, taste, and smell. Me and you have to walk by faith and not by sight, touch, taste, or smell. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, For we walk by faith and not by sight. You see, somebody can look the part. They can have on a suit and tie. They can have their hair slicked back. They can have a big smile on their face. But they're just as full of devils as Anton LaVey was. Somebody like Kenneth, I use Kenneth Copeland a lot. That is the creepiest man I've ever seen in my life. I'd rather be in the same room with Anton LaVey. I think Anton LaVey would have less devils than Kenneth Copeland. I mean, look at Kenneth Copeland's eyes. And not just that, but look what's coming out of his mouth when he's got those devil-possessed looking eyes. He's crazy. Um, and you can tell the deceiver, if you're in the book enough, that he's going against the scriptures. We walk by faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We walk by faith, not by sight. Isaac should have known as soon as he heard the voice that he was being deceived. But it says in verse 23 in Genesis 27, And he discerned him not, because his hands were hairy, as his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. He completely went by a feeling. Some days you may not feel saved, but what does the Bible say? Sometimes you may feel like God isn't treating you right, but what does the Bible say? Sometimes you may think your experience determines the truth, or your feelings determine things. Because of what you felt, because of what you experienced, because you had this great experience at church. But what does the Bible say? You can't go by emotions and feelings and just be carried by that. There's a lot of people that just, they're carried by that. They have no ground in the, they've not grounded themselves in the truth of the word at all. And going to church for them is not about learning the truth. They don't learn any truth. 
They go for an experience and to have emotion and feelings. And I guess we all need a little bit of that too. But you need the truth first. Or your experiences, emotions, feelings will carry you in the wrong direction. And if somebody gets up that's really smooth and slick, a lot of charisma, knows how to fluctuate his voice, you'll think that he's right and full of the Holy Ghost just to how he's preaching instead of going by, is he preaching the truth or is he preaching a heresy? But just because he fluctuates his voice and screams and yells and makes you feel a certain way and sends shivers down your spine, you think, wow, this is, the, this is a man of God. You don't go by that stuff. You go by what did he say? Does it line up with the Bible? And you're not going to know if what he says lines up with the Bible if you are not consistently in the Bible. Verse 24, and he said, Art thou my very son Esau? And he said, I am. Once again, he's still suspecting that something is off. If you have this much doubt that you should, that, that something is not right, you should go ahead and pray fast and not even be concerned with eating. But remember, Isaac is so worried about getting himself satisfied physically. He's wanting that food. But remember, it says in Romans 14, 23, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. <coughs> That's a good verse for this. Isaac's doubting like crazy about what's going on. But he's ready to eat. It says in verse 25, And he said, Bring it near to me, and I will eat of my son's venison, that my soul may bless thee. And he brought it near to him, and he did eat, and he brought him wine, and he drank. The saying is that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And that's true. That's where that saying could come from right here. Isaac doubts. It's almost like he knows it's Jacob, but he's just hungry. It's like you told, if you told your uh, son to go get you some Chick-fil-A, your Chick-fil-A is your favorite, he brings Popeye's, and then when he gets there, you're so hungry, you don't even care that he didn't bring Chick-fil-A, you're going to eat the Popeye's anyway. Just because you're so hungry, you cannot wait any longer. I think... In verse 26, it says, And his father Isaac said unto him, Come near now and kiss me, my son. I think he's wanting to kiss him, to smell him, and make sure that it's really Esau because he's trying to go by physical senses. He's wanting to get close enough to smell him. Is this really Esau? I can't see you. I hear you. You don't sound like Esau. You sound like Jacob. You feel like Esau. But do you smell like Esau? He's just going by all his senses. And it says, And he came near and kissed him, and he smelled the smell of his raiment, and blessed him, and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field which the Lord hath blessed. So now he's going to bless him. Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven, and the fatness of the earth, and plenty of corn and wine. Let people serve thee, and nations bow down to thee. Be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be every one that curseth thee, and blessed be he that blesseth thee. And it came to pass, as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob, and Jacob was yet scarce gone out from the presence of Isaac his father, that Esau his brother came in from his hunting. So Jacob hightails it out of there, and in comes Esau. After Jacob got blessed, he got out of there like a bolt of lightning. And it says, And he also had made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of this son, his son's venison, that my, thy soul may bless me. And Isaac his father said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn son, Esau. Isaac is thinking, I just talked to Esau. Who in the world is this? And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and, and brought it me, and I have eaten of all before thou camest, and have blessed him? Yea, and he shall be blessed. Notice it says, Yea, and he shall be blessed. This thing is irreversible. He can't go back and take it away. 
And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. You see, Esau had already sold his birthright back in chapter 25. The Lord was angry with Esau for counting temporal things like a bowl of chili more worthwhile than your birthright. Remember what it said in Hebrews twelve sixteen through 17 about Esau. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. It said, he who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Isaac knew what had happened. And he said, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. Jacob the supplanter came in with subtlety, like Jonadab in Second Samuel thirteen three. He was subtle like the serpent in Genesis three, as Second Corinthians eleven three explains. He was subtle like the strange woman in Proverbs seven and verse ten. He was full of full of all subtlety, like El Elimus the sorcerer in Acts eight eight through ten. It says in verse thirty six, and he said, "Is not he rightly?" This is Esau talking. He said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times to take away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? So the birthright allows the oldest male to receive a double portion of the inheritance. As it talks about in Deuteronomy 21.17. But remember, Esau sold it and this it just sounds just like a brother whining about another brother esau even tells isaac a lie here himself it makes you kind of feel bad for isaac because his wife lied to him his two sons lied to him and he's laying there thinking he's on his deathbed it's a pretty sad story jacob may have taken esau's blessing but he didn't take his birthright he said he he said he stole his birthright and his blessing. Remember, he sold, he sold his birthright in the previous chapters. And 37 through 38 says, And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him I have made him thy Lord, and all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. I guess this is where he sought repentance carefully with tears. But, you know, he's not truly repentant like he should be. Esau is only concerned with himself. But in 39 and 40, it says, And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And this does happen in 2 Kings eight twenty through 22 with the Edomites that come from Esau. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of my mourning for my father at hand, then I will slay my brother Jacob. Esau pictures the world's view of a Christian. They hate you. And notice, the Lord knows everything that you say in your heart. It says Esau said this in his heart, and it was recorded in the scriptures what he said in his heart. Genesis 6, 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Matthew 9, 4, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? God knows what's in your heart. Now, verse 42 through 44, And these words of Esau, Her elder son were told to Rebekah, and she sent and called Jacob her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, doth comfort himself, purposing to kill thee. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, flee thou to Laban, my brother to Haran, and tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away. You see, she said, And tarry with him a few days, until thy brother's fury turn away. So she thinks it will only be a few days that Jacob's going to be gone, but they're going to reap what they've sown. Jacob and Rebekah are going to reap what they've sown. She doesn't get to see Jacob again. He serves Laban for 20 years. 
It says in Genesis thirty-one thirty-eight. Now verse 45, Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? She thinks, you know, Esau is going to kill him in a rage. And then somebody's just going to come kill Esau for killing Jacob. But she never did fetch him from thence. She was deprived of him. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are of the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? You see, Rebecca is acting like she's worried about the daughters of Heth, Jacob taking one of the daughters of Heth. But this was just Re Rebecca's excuse to Isaac for why Jacob was going to her brother Laban's. Although at the same time she wouldn't have wanted him to take a wife of the daughters of Heth, obviously anyway, they they're the uh they come from, you know, the Canaanites. And you know, she didn't want him to intermarry into idolatry, but the real reason was because she was trying to get Jacob safe away from Esau. And something to note is that Abraham lied about his wife two times. He <coughs> Abraham taught his wife to lie. He told Sarah to lie and say that she was his sister. Then Isaac lied about his wife. He taught his wife to lie. He taught Rebekah to lie. And now Rebekah teaches Jacob to deceive his father. You see, these men were all raised up telling lies. They raised their kids to lie. They raised their wives to lie. And it's all coming back in their face. You know, we're all liars, but we need to have a zeal for the truth and quit telling lies. We need to, don't teach your kids to lie and tell lies to their own parents and to each other. It says in <coughs> Psalm 58, 3, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. You see, we've all got a problem with lying. In Ephesians 4.25, Paul says, Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Put away lying. Put away the deception. Just like you would any other sin of the flesh. A good way to overcome deception is don't deceive people yourself. I've heard that the easiest person to con is the con artist. Um... <coughs> You're going to have to quit being so deceptive. I believe the more you deceive somebody, the more you're going to end up being deceived. The more lies you tell, the more you're end up going to end up being lied to. So, that's Genesis 27. What a story. And I hope you've found some ways to overcome deception.